This panel is called the clubs of REH, and what it's going to entail is we're going to talk about some of the clubs that, that Howard was actually in and all the clubs that have come after him uh, because of Howard fandom, uh, which is particularly appropriate for this Howard days because in this Howard days we are celebrating Howard fandom. So that means we're celebrating all of you guys. So, so we're glad you're here and, and uh, hopefully we'll be somewhat entertaining and somewhat informative and, and uh, we'll probably be wanting a lot of questions to come from you guys because, well, we're, we're only halfway prepared right now. I'm uh, the official editor of RAHOOPA, the Robert E. Howard United Press Association. It's the Howard app. Oh, I've got one over here somewhere. And uh, um, we're, we're the, uh, uh, the Howard Literary Club more, more than anything else. Uh, but before we get into that, uh, I would like to introduce uh, my other panelists. Uh, Mr. Lee Brakeiron here in the yellow shirt. Uh, he is, Lee is the, the king of Howard fanzines. He's working on a magnum opus of everything that you ever wanted to know about Howard and Howard fanzines are going to be included when, eventually when he publishes his book, <laughs> we hope. And uh, Mr. Rusty Burke, uh, he may or may not need any introduction, but uh, Rusty was uh, a one-time official editor of uh, Rahupa, but in addition to that, he was the, uh, the series editor for, uh, for Wandering Star and the Del Rey books, the Howard books. And uh, plus he's, he's done a couple of other things in Howard studies, so uh, uh, we'll, we're going to let him slide on, slide on in on that. Um, so anyway, uh, I think the, uh, thank you. I think the, probably uh, when we start talking about the clubs of Robert E. Howard, uh, we need to talk about some of the clubs that he was actually in. There, there were literary clubs and there were apazines back in the in the 1920s and 30s. And uh, he belonged to uh, to a couple of them. Uh, the most prominent one that, that he belonged to, and you guys can jump in on this, is uh, the Junto. It's called the Junto. And uh, Howard and uh, a number of his literary pals, uh, what they did was they created a fanzine, but all it was was, here's a, a typewritten page. This is the fanzine. You can add to it. And and so and they would literally send e send the typewritten page around to the they so mail it. I mail it. List. Yeah. And it would just keep going down the list until finally it got to the person who had started it, who exactly. got all the other people's comments and stuff. Everybody would contribute. They'd all type out you know their their contribution or their mailing comments or or what have you, and then you just mail it to the to the next guy. And how many uh, how many members did they end up having? Do you think? It was over a dozen, wasn't it? Where's Rob Rain when you need him? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they but had, anyway, they had one member, I think, in Minnesota or Wisconsin or something. They, they, uh, they came out of the Lone Scouts, uh, which was an organization for boys who didn't have a Boy Scout troop nearby or something, or didn't weren't inclined toward that kind of formal grouping. And so the Lone Scouts had little publications that they would do and sh swap with each other. And Truett Benson had been a Lone Scout and had known a lot of these guys from around the country. Uh, but most of them were in Texas. Uh, Howard also did a, uh, a, a publication of his own, which we can include as a club, uh, called The Right Hook. And again, it was uh, uh, just a uh, uh, Pages that he would type out, and he would send around. He had other. He had contributors for that as well. Oh, well, true and Clyde. Yeah, like yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it was all about boxing, right hook. You know, it uh, occurs to me though, Andy, um, before the Junto, he was when he met Clyde at Brownwood. Clyde had that all-around club, and they did the all-around magazine. Yeah. So that was a club. Statement. Yeah, yeah. So it was him and Truett and Clyde, but it was a club. We can all learn stuff here today. <laughs> uh, and and wasn't he, he was involved with something else too, wasn't he, with, along those same lines? Uh, the, as the Junto and the Right Hook? What was the, the Toreador, what was that? Well, the Toreador was Truett's gene. Okay. And, uh, but Howard also did one called the Golden Caliph. Golden Caliph, you should, you should know that. 
Uh, I should. Uh, <laughs> uh, Golden Caliph is the or official organ of Arupa. You produced a lot more Golden Caliphs than Bob did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, um, so those are the, the clubs that Howard was involved with. And, and he also, uh, uh, he wrote uh, uh, for a lot of fan publications, you know, that, that were, you know, they were semi-professional. They, they weren't uh, the Pulse. And, and you know, uh, in the 20s and 30s, in on that, in know. the 20s and 30s, fandom was just emerging, and that was mostly through the letters columns of the magazines. These guys would get in touch with each other, and then some of them started doing fanzines. Now Lee's going to know a lot more about that stuff than, than I've got packed away in my head. So, do you have any comments you want to make about the early fanzines? Oh, I'm getting to them. Okay. <laughs> I, I'll just I'm going to do a quick overview here too. And, to let you know what we're what we're going to be talking about, we're also going to talk about uh, in the fifties the Hyborian League came about, and what that was it was primarily it, it was a it was the club that was wrapped around the uh, uh, the semi pro zine Amra. A lot of you are familiar with Amra. It was Amra was it, it started out as being involved with with Robert E. Howard, but uh, uh, it soon e evolved into just a general fantasy type of uh, uh, type of publication. But there was a club attached to that, which of course their mailing list, that was the, uh, the Hyborian League. Uh, and in 1972, uh, Rehupa got started. Rehupa is the Robert E. Howard United Press Association, the Howard APA. And uh, uh, that got started uh, by a 15-year-old uh, fellow named Tim Marion. And uh, I think the, the first issue is like six pages or something. It's, it, it, but he uh, he had the you know he had the uh, the tenacity to get a hold of Glenn Lord and have Glenn Lord make a contribution. So he kind of uh, validated the the uh, Rahuva right from the start, and uh, Rahuva eventually grew into a, a rather large club. Uh, right now uh, we're limited to 30 members. Um, and it's ongoing. Root has been been published since 1972, so that's 46 years of ongoing service to Robert E. Howard Fandom. Um, uh, well, and then you know we can talk about Howard Days as being a Howard Club, and you guys are all members of, of the Robert E. Howard Club at, at at Howard Days just because. You all show up here to honor the legacy of Robert E. Howard, so and so good on you guys. Um, the uh, uh, also the um, the Robert E. Howard Foundation got started in 2006, and that's another Howard Club. Uh, the uh, there's uh, approximately 175 members right now of various stages in in their membership. Uh, and the Howard uh, Foundation publishes a newsletter, a quarterly newsletter, of which Mr. Brakein is now the editor. Uh, so that's another Howard Club that we consider. And then we we have to consider, of course, the biggest Howard Club of all, which is the World Wide Web. There, uh, ever since the, the 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 web got started in the early 90s, the uh, explosion of Robert E. Howard information and articles and essays and opinions. Uh, you guys all know about, about the internet and uh, how much power you can find on there. Now. It's just, it's unbelievable. Uh, and, uh, and as an offshoot of that, Facebook has come around. And if you look on Facebook now uh, for anything Robert, devoted to Robert E. Howard, you, you're gonna find at least 20 different groups or clubs or pages devoted to Robert E. Howard uh, of all sorts, you know. Who's a member of more than one? <laughs> there you go. So, uh, and, and that's, and that, uh, and that will bring us up to, that kind of encapsulates what we're, what we're going to talk about. Uh, do we want to turn it over to you and, and uh, yeah, see, what, so. see what you got here? Yeah. Uh, I'll repeat a little of what you said, but anyway. Lee, Lee is much better prepared than we are. <laughs> um, the first fanzine devoted to uh, Robert E. Howard, of, of any note, was the uh, Hyborian League, which was, uh, well, they misspelled Hyborian, but anyway, 
Uh, it was founded in 1955 uh, by Sprague de Camp, uh, John Clark, and others. Uh, they met at conventions and published 71 issues of their fanzine uh, Amra through 1982. Did you mention the, the first volume and the second volume? Well, the first volume hardly bears mentioning because there were no know, but, one you know, but that's why sometimes people wonder why does it say volume two yeah, yeah. when everything is volume two? Well, actually, there were a couple of issues in volume yeah, one. two or six. I, I don't know. And it was and essentially, essentially, thing. George Heap did a membership list and a little bit of news about what the next convention they were going to be going to was, and that's what started AMRA. But then George Scissors always insisted on giving George Heap credit for having started AMRA. The last issue of AMRA had a letter from Andy. Second to last issue. Second yeah. last. Yeah, AMRA number 70. I had a I had an article that was published in it. So I made my bones in hard fandom in AMRA. Of course, you were Gordon Cavalier. I was Gordon, Ca Gordon W. Cavalier. <laughs> and he was complaining about the Conan movie. I was. Before the game came out. Yeah. Profit. <laughs> um, Okay, by far the largest and the uh, most active uh, such club has been the Robert E. Howard uh, United Press Association, or RAHUPA, which was founded in 1972 by the 13-year-old Tim Marion. Well, um, I this, stand correct. <laughs> this was a, a type of fan club uh, was known as a uh, an amateur press association, <coughs> or APA, or APA. Uh, a uniquely American development uh, consisting of independent, uh, non-professional writers uh, sharing an interest in journalistic activity, uh, many on a particular topic, which might be artistic, literary, political, or scientific in nature, uh, or some cultural phenomenon like uh, science fiction, uh, comic books, or other magazines, uh, music, sports, or gaming. Uh, in particular, uh, Pulp Fiction uh, created uh, communities of fans who, um, beyond uh, interacting through magazine letter columns, uh, began to meet, organize their own clubs, uh, and publish commentary uh, and fiction for one another in self-published magazines called fanzines, apazines, or simply zines. Typically, the members uh, receive no financial cons uh, compensation, and their zines are uh, traditionally circulated free of charge or uh, for a nominal cost to defray postage or production expenses, uh, or in exchange for uh, similar publications or contributions of art, uh, articles um, or letters of comment, uh, sent to some member selected to be the official editor, or OE, uh, who may have Xeroxed them or just collated copies that were then either typed and then uh, uh, printed or uh, Xeroxed by the individual members. The uh, very earliest apps of zines, even when H.P. Lovecraft was doing apps, uh, was people who were actually amateur printers. They had their own little printing presses and they would actually do the printing of these magazines, and uh, frequently they were showing off their printing skills. And then it evolved, when fandom took over, it evolved into mimeography or uh, what other, whatever other kind Hectographs, of yeah. Hectographs, yeah. I'll get to those. <laughs> <laughs> um, the um, zines may have uh, been stapled together or left separate by the OE, who then uh, would send the complete sets back to each member as what are called mailings. Uh, the amount, frequency, and na nature of these submissions uh, are generally regulated, uh, as are the number and type of uh, contributing members. Um, currently, uh, Rehupa, as we've heard, is uh, limited to 30 members, uh, each of which must submit uh, at least uh, two pages every uh, two bi-monthly mailings, uh, duplicated for each member, and they also pay dues. Um, uh, the first zines uh, consisted of simple carbon copies, uh, but that proved insufficient uh, for many copies. So early fanzines were then generally uh, hand-drafted uh, or typed um, 
on a manual typewriter and uh, duplicated by some low-cost method uh, like the ditto, uh, the hectograph, or the mimeograph uh, process. Anybody remember getting high on ditto fluid? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which uh, required each member to have access to some special equipment. You see the examples of them up there. Slide. Um, now, in the late um, 1960s, the cheaper processes, these cheaper processes began to be supplanted uh, by Xerox photocopying uh, with the advent of computer printers and uh, desktop desktop publishing in the 1980s, uh, fanzines came to look for a more professional. Uh, the rise of the internet uh, made correspondence cheaper and faster, and the World Wide Web uh, made publishing a fanzine as simple as coding a web page. Official editor duties uh, would expand to include APA promotion, <coughs> member recruitment, uh, and admission. Uh, ruling on submission attainments, um, and conducting votes on rules changes and member expulsion. Um, as you might imagine, the early Rahupa uh, zines were very fanish and personal, and uh, too often had little to do with Howard. Uh, this kind of thing took its toll on morale by 1975 when Don Heron and other defectors left to uh, start a splinter APA called the Hyperborean League. Uh, the League put out 13 issues uh, in 1975 through 1978 uh, before dissolving. The but gradually, the Rahupa mailings uh, improved in length, uh, relevancy, and professionalism. Uh, and the uh, number of members uh, began to grow, including more and more competent uh, fanzinists, uh, collectors, and artists. Uh, honing their skills in Rahupa, uh, many would go on to be first-rate uh, critics, scholars, editors, and uh, small press publishers. Uh, by far, most of the uh, Howard critics, scholars, and historians in the U.S. Uh, have served in the ranks of Rahupa at one time or another. Rahupa would go on for 46 years, and still going, uh, by now racking up 270 mailings, uh, now 271, yeah. uh, totaling uh, over 44,000 uh, pages by hundreds of contributors, Someday I want to come up with an exact number of contributors, <laughs> but I, it, it, I was, thought it'd be too much work for this. Oh, uh, all the while, uh, leading the way is the world's um, preeminent organization, uh, championing the works and the legacy of Robert E. Howard. And um, the contents of many zines, in fact, have been uh, later published in critical, scholarly, or historical papers, articles, introductions, books or web posts. Uh, through such activity, the uh, APA has uh, fulfilled two of its intended purposes, to serve as a training ground for Howard advocates and experts, and to provide a forum where their treatises uh, could be critiqued and improved upon prior to publication. Um, as an organization, Rahupa has uh, been promoting the literary recognition and popularity of our Texas author worldwide with its leadership and support of such activities as Robert E. Howard Days, uh, supporting the endeavors of the Robert E. Howard Foundation, which has been publishing definitive uh, editions of all Howard's works, and uh, spearheading uh, the drive to increase Howard's recognition in academia by presenting papers at uh, literary conventions. Uh, Rehupa is, is, well, I don't want to take all the credit, but Rehupa is largely responsible for there being a Howard Days. In 1985, Rusty Burke uh, over there, that guy over there, and another fan named Vern Clark decided that uh, they would, they loved Robert E. Howard, they decided they would come to Texas 
is to see where he lived. You know, I, and I have just been transferred to Houston. It, it, exactly. Yeah. So you were you were in Texas, and but totally, I, it was kind of a, an off the cuff thing. They decided to come to Cross Plains, and fortunately, they. Uh, I'll, I'll let Rusty tell more of the story, but. But fortunately, uh, Rusty hooked up with the right people here in town, and uh, but it was because of Rahupa that they knew each other, and it was because of uh, uh, Rahupa that they got the people of Cross Plains interested. You know, here was a Howard Club that uh, you know they came to Cross Plains, and uh, the people Including of Cross Plains. We had on our first visit, we had ten of us, and yeah. Three were from overseas, but two guys from Switzerland and one from Australia, and that really impressed them. <laughs> like people will come from that far away to come to this little town just because of this author. So when the Howard House came up for sale a couple of years later, they put together a group, Project Pride. Uh, a number of the members put their own money on the line to take out the mortgage on it and buy the house. <coughs> and then they invited us. We actually came to put together a what was it, the 100th mailing of Renupa? Or yeah, that was in 1989, yeah. And uh, we had decided to come to Cross Plains to do that, and they said, well, we have a surprise for you when you come. And when we got here, they had bought the house. And we were able to walk through it. Boy, it's a mess at that time. Oh, boy. <laughs> but but uh, they've done just an amazing job. Exactly, but uh, pretty much the, the reason that, uh, that Howard Days exists is because of the, the, the gathering that Rusty organized in 1986 when he got nine other people, including Glenn Lord, to, uh, to show up here in, in Cross Plains. And the people of Cross Plains realized that they had something here. And here, was a, here was a club of Robert E. Howard. We showed up here in Cross Plains, and they realized that, that they had something here that was unique to the entire world. They, they, the author of a world-known figure, Conan the, Conan the Sumerian, Conan the Barbarian, the author of, of that iconic figure lived and worked in their town. And they realized that, that you know, they needed to share that with, with other people. And you guys are all here sharing it with everybody else. And, uh, I, want to, I want to tell you a story that's a very amusing in hindsight. Uh, Vern and I came up in, I think it was September of 85. 85. Um, yeah. And on our way, I was just in awe. And on our way back to Houston, I was saying, man, we got to get other people to come here and see, to appreciate what a staggering imagination Bob Howard had. Because once you see what he was working with, you're like, where did he come up with all that stuff? And Vern said, are you nuts? Nobody's going to come all the way here to look at a little white farmhouse. And just sort of blew it off. But Almost instantly, Graham Flanagan from Canberra said, well, I'm coming to the States anyway to go to Blues Festival, so yeah, I'd like to go. And a new member popped in and said, yeah, I'll come on down. And I decided that uh, it sounded like a pretty good in, uh, pretty good uh, activity to get involved with. I didn't know any of these guys, but uh, I knew that I wanted to come here. I, I knew that I had the passion for Robert E. Howard, and uh, I figured this is probably a once-in-a-lifetime thing. I'm going to talk about more about this tonight, but uh, once in a lifetime thing, and and I knew that I wanted to be involved. And sometimes you don't really know why, or you know, you maybe you're a little uh, by meeting new people that that share your same passion. You're you're a little tenuous, maybe, but but uh, you know we uh, our little club got gathered together, and uh, uh, sure enough, uh, it all worked out. Just in case any of you are trying to memorize Lee's slide here, uh, I'm going to quibble with a couple of things. Tim Marion was the founder, but the OE ship rotated during those years. It was more like each each mailing, and the next guy on the membership list would be the <coughs> central mailer that you were supposed to send your zines to him, and then you know somebody might drop out before it was their turn or whatever, and Tim stepped in, I think, once or twice, but then in 76, they elected their first ongoing OE, uh, John Bacon, um, and then you left out Morgan Holmes as oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Poor true. Morgan, uh, Morgan yes. out there. Morgan was editor for three years, I believe. Yeah. In 
So you were 88 to what, 90 or 91? 88 to 94. <coughs> and then Morgan for a couple or three years. Yeah. And then you, and then, yeah, and you ever right. since. I left him out yeah. because he was an, what he's called an emergency editor. No, what actually, really? Morgan was over no, there. He, 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 yeah. okay. he was actually, he was actually the real deal. Um, so that's all right. He's not here. Morgan's not here, so. Uh, <laughs> I thought maybe Jerry had told you. We can, we can cut that out of the out of the video. You know, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll strike Morgan's name right out of the video. Um, what else have we got? I I can probably talk. I talk a little bit about the mechanics of Rahuka, what what it entails to uh, to actually contribute to uh, to a. A fancy on Apazine like this, um, and and Lee of course covered it, but I'll I'll try and give you a little more in depth. But what it is is everybody, uh, the members of Rahuka, and we're limited to 30 members because we decided that uh, when Howard was uh, was 30 years old, that's when he died, and uh, we just picked that number because if it gets too big, it's like you know. This is a fan activity. This is a hobby thing that we all do. We do it for fun. We don't do it for to make any money. We actually have to pay money to belong to the club and, and get the, the mailings uh, sent to us. But uh, every member produces his own personal fanzine. Now, uh, because this is the Robert E. Howard APA, uh, and it's devoted to Robert E. Howard, you would think that, for the most part, uh, that your fanzines would be about Robert E. Howard or something related to Robert E. Howard. You know, uh, Howard was was a, a fan of, of so many things. He wrote about so many things. There's a lot of things that could be included in in your Rahuka zine that are you know, related to Robert E. Howard. Uh, if you like sports, you like football, or or uh, Boxing, you know, well, Howard liked those things. Uh, if you liked, uh, well, there, there's a lot of things that, that Howard liked. So that, in, in that vein, your zine, your personal zine, should be related to Robert E. Howard. Now, it wasn't always this way. For, for a while there, it was, uh, uh, I won't tell you which editor it was, but, but uh, he, uh, he included a lot of his, his friends, more like his cronies, who, uh, they just, you know, they, they wrote about fairyland and, you know, just all kinds of, you know, totally unrelated things to Robert E. Howard. And, uh, well, not meaning to toot my own horn too much, but when I came in, it, well, we, uh, there's a famous incident of uh, we, we got some new members and there, there were two girls and they produced a fanzine about the Ramones. Wait a minute, a, a fanzine about the Ramones in the Robert E. Howard Appa. Well, Rusty and I took umbrage to that. <laughs> well, you know, what, what, I took, um, what we took umbrage to was not that. It was the fact that they told us to quit being boring old farts and talking about Robert E. Howard. What are you writing so much about Robert E. Howard for? Well, duh, it's the Robert E. Howard Appa. Come on. Yeah. And they weren't around very long, <laughs> thankfully. No, and and it was about that time that we started harsh. to get back on track. And and uh, we just we more or less we we press the issue that this is the Robert E. Howard Alpha. Write about Robert E. Howard, will you? Come on. And uh, and fortunately, the as the membership grew, the membership grew because there were fans of Robert E. Howard out there who wanted to write about Robert E. Howard. We were fortunate enough to to have most of them come through the Alpha. Uh, we should talk about some of the famous people who have been in Rahupa. Mike Stackpole is an extra hooven, and he's a uh, New York Times best-selling author. Uh, he's written a lot of the Star Wars novels. Uh, he's Conan also got some new stuff coming out, which you can't talk about. Right? But he wrote the Conan movie novelization. He wrote the yeah. He wrote the uh, the 2011 uh, uh, Conan movie novelization. Um, Nancy Collins. Nancy A. Collins, who uh, has created uh, Sonya Blue, Sun Sunglasses After Dark, Sonya Blue, and. Uh, She's also a big time comic book writer. She's written uh, Vampirella Swamp and Swamp Thing. Thing. Yeah, yeah. Charles and DeLint was a member very briefly. And she she also won the Bram Stoker yeah. Award yeah. Uh, for, for Sonya Blue. So she's fairly famous. Uh, who else? Charles DeLint. Charles DeLint was very briefly a member. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, there, there have been some people that have just kind of dipped their toe in Rahupa. Can you, can you think of anybody else? Oh, famous. <laughs> one point I would make about a few, but I can't think one of point I would make about Phantom and, and about Rahupa is it leads up to Rahupa, but in the very, very early days of Phantom in the 20s and 30s, where the fans are finding each other through the letters pages of the magazines, and they get this guy's name, and they ask the editors to send a letter to him or whatever, and they started creating their own fanzines and developing mailing lists from that. And then Howard, of course, sent uh, the, uh, what do they call it? Gods of the North, the Frost Giant's Daughter, which they got retitled yeah. Gods of the North to a fanzine. He sent uh, Garden of uh, was it Spirit of Clontarf too. Yeah. Spirit, no. What's the Hyborian uh, oh. story? The Garden of uh, the Garden of Fear. Of Fear. He the Garden of Fear. Sent that to a fanzine. So several of his he would send yeah. things to fanzine editors if, he, if they had it sold. And the same um, with the Hyborian Age too. He sent. So coming out of that, then you had, for instance, Don Walheim uh, started out as fan. He does the Fantagraph which did Always Comes Evening, you know, printed Always Comes Evening and the early part of the Hyborian Age. Uh, Walheim then went on to become a professional editor. Several of these guys went on to become professional editors, but Walheim is particularly significant because then he uh, became Avon fantasy reader. If you've seen those, there's several Howard stories in that series. Uh, then later he became Ace Books, the Conan the Conqueror, Ace Double. That was Don Walheim's doing. Uh, when Al Murek came out in favor back in the 60s, that was Don Walheim's doing, and, and a lot of that kind of activity came out of fandom, what we would call now fandom. Um, it all had to do with people finding other fans. Well, until the internet, that wasn't easy. Uh, a lot of us grew up in communities where we didn't know other people who liked this weird stuff. Uh, I, had a, I was fortunate, I had a couple of friends in elementary school and, and middle school who, like me, liked, liked Edgar Rice Burroughs, and then they introduced me to J.R.R. Tolkien, and we kind of liked it, but, but we, weren't, we weren't in the literary mainstream of our schools or our communities, and so it was not easy to find other fans until this thing called the internet came along, and Ed Waterman joined Rehupa. He mm -hmm. got in touch with me first, and he we communicated back and forth, and he joined Rehupa, and he said, Rehupa don't have a website. And he created one, and suddenly we had members <coughs> busting out the seams. We were getting all, ca now mostly what we get, and we still get, is people saying, how do I subscribe? Can't do it. You've got to be a member to get Rehupa. Contributor driven vehicle. <laughs> if you don't uh, write a fanzine for it, you can't get one, sorry. So, so it was coming up, you know, again, the contact thing. It came up, we've been talking about how many first timers we have at Power Days this year. Is anybody here a first timer? So you play yeah. 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 This is great. Yeah, absolutely. This is wonderful. You're in the club. How, how in the world did you find out about this? Was it social media? Was it, how, do you, how do you find out about it? You found out about it from a hoop, but you're an insider. Social media, anybody? Um, anybody here? Anybody local who heard about it on KXAN? Or? No? It's just, it's interesting to me that we've got so many people here for the first time. Where'd you, where'd you find out about it? Because that's how fans get together, is you, you yeah, have to hear about it. Really how, if you don't hear about it, how are you going to know to, to come? Lee, 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 you're going to just, yeah, I was going to. I want to thank the gentleman for uh, taking it all off. Oh. Thank you. All right. Thank well, thank you. <laughs> I was going to add a couple more names of famous people who've been okay. members, like uh, Mark Sarazini. Yeah. And, and Chuck, uh, Hoffman. Chuck Hoffman. Chuck Hoffman. And yeah. also uh, David C. Smith. David yeah. C. Smith. Yeah. 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 Chuck Hoffman is a, a, a past guest of honor here at Howard Days. Uh, David C. Smith is working on a Howard biography. I can tell you that he's finished the draft to submit to his publisher. Woohoo! All right, should be ready to um, go. 
And well, I was going to explain just a little bit about the mechanics of Verhuza. Basically, what it is is everybody creates their own little personal fanzine, and they they send me the required amount of copies. Uh, right now, it's 34 copies. And uh, uh, what I do then is I collate all the all the, the zines together, put a couple of staples in them, and mail them out and send them out. Um, and it's. Uh, Normally it's normally it's thicker than this. <laughs> yeah. That's our smallest. Yeah, one. yeah. This is a, twenty-five a, years. <laughs> this is a small one, uh, mainly because everybody's getting ready to come to Howard days and don't have time to do a zine. Yeah, uh, a couple of old timers have turned into slackers. Well, yeah, that could be that could be like you over there. Um, <laughs> the uh, the um, uh, the membership right now is at we're at twenty-nine members. We're looking for the thirtieth. Uh, if you wanted to take a look at this, and if you're interested, uh, come see me. I'll let you look at it, but I can't let you have it. Um, and uh, uh, but it's just uh, it's just a, a good old Robert E. Howard club. You know, we've been we've been going along for for great guns for 46 years now, and uh, we, we've been at the the forefront of Robert E. Howard fandom uh, for for that long. And the cool thing about it, though, is we actually have a little magazine. We get to, you know, we can we can hold it and read it and and uh, have it in our hands, as opposed to the internet, where, you know, even reading stuff online, uh, you know, that doesn't really count. This is a this is the real deal, and uh, a lot of us are are very tactile and we're very, well, a lot of us are very old, and this is what we like. <laughs> and if you've been a member as long as as Mindy and I have, or if you're a a fierce collector like Mr. Brakeiron, you've got a nice quarter ton of boxes of Renupa mailings to carry around with you when you move. <laughs> and in fact, the um, articles that you would publish in this that you might want to publish later, uh, traditionally you're supposed to uh, publish it first in Renupa and then and elsewhere. Then Or something? <laughs> well, I do. I, I want to. I want to talk about the newest Robert E. Howard Club, and that would be the Robert E. Howard Foundation. And you might, uh, you might serve to talk about getting the foundation started up. You know, give us a little history of the foundation, and then in uh, in 2006, uh, Fred Malmberg, who at the time was uh, mostly licensing gaming and stuff. He had just bought the rights to, from uh, Jack and Barbara Baum, he had just bought the rights to Robert E. Howard Properties and Conan Properties and so forth. And I don't know how much background I want to get into, but uh, Paul Herman had been doing a lot of publishing of Public Domain Howard. I'd been working on the Wandering Star material. They were sort of at odds because the rights holders preferred the Wandering Star, of course, because it was licensed and PD stuff wasn't. So Fred Malmberg sat down with us and said, can we create a foundation to promote Robert E. Howard's work and then leave me to license gaming and movies and comics and all of that stuff, but get Robert E. Howard's actual work out and promote Howard scholarship and so forth. And Paul and I went, yeah, we could do that. Um, so essentially it was Fred Malmberg bringing us together and creating the idea of, the, of mm -hmm. having a foundation to promote Howard. Um, and the idea was we would help sponsor Robert E. Howard Days mm -hmm. and Project Pride. We would help, uh, we would provide a scholarship at the school. We would provide materials and resources for scholars. Uh, and we would try to get all the work of Robert E. Howard into print. Happily, we are one book away that not too far from publication. Uh, I'm told that if I don't finish my part, it's going to go without me, so I rest assured that it will come. Um, so the last one will be the autobiographical material, Post Oaks and Sand Rocks, and all those other little autobiographical tidbits that Howard wrote. And then we will have had, we will have everything Howard wrote into print and so forth. One of the, uh, one of the cool offshoots about uh, the, the Robert E. Howard Foundation is we decided to put out a quarterly newsletter and uh, this is the, the latest uh, the latest edition 
Uh, Lee Brakeiron is is the editor of uh, of the uh, the newsletter now, and uh, doing a bang up job. In the newsletter, well, we we usually have a little bit of news, but we always have we always make sure that we include uh, a uh, a Howard TypeScript of some sort. Uh, we well we, we've got how many pages of Howard TypeScripts do we have to choose from? Like. Oh. Tens of, thousands. Thousands. <laughs> Tens of thousands of pages. So uh, always included in uh, in the newsletter is one or maybe maybe even two Howard Howard TypeScripts what's or mission? some. What's the mission? Uh, this one is the Road of Eagles, part one of two. Um, and, uh, uh, and there's usually and sometimes we'll include. Uh, here we have a a, a collection of enough. This is some of the, some more of the Howard Club members. The Howard Foundation members, when we uh, got together at uh, Windy City Polkcon, and uh, uh, of note in this issue is not only the the TypeScript, and uh, that's that's pretty much the the bulk of the issue, but on the cover is another never before seen photo of Robert E. Howard. Rob Green uh, was in touch with uh, Lindsay Tyson's family, and. Uh, uh, and he he was able to uh, find another how, uh, photo of Robert E. Howard. This is a photo of Howard with Lindsay Tyson and and Tevis Clyde Smith. And we had never seen this one before. And it shows Howard. Uh, he's brandishing a sword, and he is also has a head of curly hair, which we haven't seen too many uh, photos of of Howard with with that much curly hair. So uh, I invite you to. Take a look at this if you like. Uh, if you are a foundation member, hopefully you've got these. I sent these out last week. Jack, you got yours, uh, and, and Russell got his. I know. Um, and uh, but there's and always these. If you're not a foundation member, who's the membership guy? So talk. Yeah, about. you can. You can. <laughs> we can. We can work something out. Uh, in addition to uh, to newsletters, we occasionally send out a little perk, a, a little maybe a little TypeScript or or uh, uh, some kind of Esoteric uh, Howard deal. One, one thing we sent out uh, a Robert E. Howard uh, uh, Christmas card, and uh, we used to do pins, but they got too expensive, so we unfortunately we don't do those. But uh, we're, we'll be looking to uh, send out another perk uh, sometime sometime soon. I hope we sh we should probably talk about that. And uh, um, but there's always something. Kind of unique, and and it's only available to uh, foundation members. Yes, uh, some pieces have only been published in the newsletter. Yeah, you know, rare versions or in, incomplete uh, works of Howard. Yeah, and uh, for example, with some of the perks, we uh, we recently uh, redid the uh, uh, or we we published the the draft uh, the the synopsis. The draft and the draft of uh, the Shadows of Zambula, well, Man Eaters of Zambula, and it included the map that was uh, uh, that that Howard drew to to uh, to do the story, and uh, uh, just little things like that. So, uh, another Howard Club, and uh, uh, it's a pretty good one. Uh, there was a lot of neat stuff, and also 10% off on on all Foundation Press books. Uh, what other what other we have a secret handshake, which nobody has figured out yet, so uh, it's real don't have to worry about that. Uh, we got about 10 minutes before the next panel is supposed to start. You might want to ask if anybody's got yeah, questions. Yeah, questions. We, we, we could take questions now, or, or uh, and then the next panel will start up at 2.30, so if, uh, if, if you got, anybody's got any questions. Joe? George R. R. Martin wrote about the Lee Hoopins doing a form of block work. You know what happened? How come that happened? No, I don't. I didn't I, even know it. I was happened. unaware of that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. He did. I'll uh, who, who's yeah. George R. R. Martin? <laughs> 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 All right. Um, Nancy Collins was a pretty good friend of George when they were both in New Orleans, so yeah, he, he might have found yeah, out about her. Or, yeah, or actually, uh, Patrice has a said that yeah. he had a. Pictures. We, we all we met uh, a number of us met in at the World Fantasy Con in Chicago in 1990, and there's a picture with Carl Edward Wagner and Bernd Clark and I can't remember who else is at the table, yeah. 
And Patrice just noticed the other day, he said he got the photo out and he noticed that there's a nameplate on the table for George R. R. Martin. So he had been at our table too. So, so he may have met us at World So Fantasy. Joe, what you're saying is uh, we're famous and we don't even know it? That's right. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Is, is someone write, I mean, writing down this history into uh, an, a long article or something? Because I do think it'd be very fascinating um, to track. Yes. Uh, essentially, my um, last several zines in Rahupa have been uh, recounting the, the history of, uh, of the organization. But it's all it's part of a larger work, a uh, yeah. secondary bibliography of Robert E. Howard. So yeah. pretty much everything ever written about Robert E. Howard yeah. is going to eventually. Okay, there's the the history that I'm going through the history of the scene. Yeah. That that will take years with the 271 mailings. But uh, okay, that's one project, and the other project is the bibliography of the secondary sources. Now that's that's a listing of all the uh, papers and books and so on that's been about Howard, along with abstracts of what they're about. And that's you're still doing that on. Uh, yeah, uh, I should be. Posting a preliminary version of that on the uh, foundation website in a few months for comment, and then later it will be published as a book. Okay, cool. And, uh, and, and I just meant more like the, the history of people who were involved who organized it. Kind of like this discussion yeah. right now. Actually, a few several years ago, uh, Jim Van Hyas, who at the time was a member of Rehupa, did a pretty thorough history up to that point. Yeah. But then Lee yeah, that's has just been going into more depth. With Rehupa. Yeah, I'm trying to include all the other organizations that are related uh, as I go along. Is there a digital archive of all the mailings? There's not a digital archive, I don't think. Uh, no, not generally not available. Not uh, if you want, uh, you, <laughs> we, want to we browse, with, you can join yeah. the uh, <laughs> Rehupa. We, we did some aren't reluctant because we don't want to get sued by somebody who was, who was a former member and we're, and we're Providing their material, you know, guys, famous people who have who have provided material for Rahuba. Well, we we don't want them to sue us, but we we'll work something out. See us after the after the panel. There are <laughs> there are physical uh, archives at uh, Bowling Green State University oh, yeah. and where else? Uh, well, actually, there's some yeah. old very old Rahupas at the Cross Plains Library and and also yeah. at Ranger Ranger, Ranger College, College in Ranger. Ranger. Yeah, they have it. They have an archive there. Texas A&M too. They have a. They have Rehoboth too. They have Robert Howard collection. Well, I know they have a Howard collection. They have Rehoboth. Those are the. We, we have a. We have a man patiently with his hand. Luke, Luke, so, just jump in there. So are they essentially each one of these scenes though is a thirty-four print run though, right? Right. Yeah. And that's all there is. That's, that's all there is. It. Yep. Uh, what's the turnover in terms of membership? I mean, obviously, there's people that have been in the organization for a long period of time, but you're sure. always talking about people that have had shorter stints. Like, what's the, the, what's the average? Oh, I would, I would think the the average for uh, for temporary members, I don't know, three years maybe, four years, yeah. something like that. We we Never publish done. we publish uh, six mailings a year every other month, and uh, uh, and you're only required to. To contribute in every other mailing, so really the, the the basics for being a member is you have to produce six pages a year of, of original self-generated material, and, and that's all. And, and Probably you know, each year, what about three or four people will burn out and, and leave. It. Yeah. So there, there are usually any year, given year, there'll be a few opportunities during the year to you can get on a wait list, yeah. and then as soon as somebody drops out or decides they want to go on sabbatical. And because we or are if Indy ever changes his mind and decides to boot me the next time I miss a deadline. We are we are a little picky about who we take, right? I mean, well, you can't just be a collector who wants to get members. Well, you know, we, we, have, we have done that, but yeah. we, we like for you to contribute, you know, and, and we want to hear your thoughts about Robert E. Howard and, and th all things that are related. Dr. Kaufman, yes? Isn't, isn't the rule still there about the uh, wait list should contribute to the scene? There is, yeah, yeah. You can get on the wait list and you can contribute. Uh, you can contribute, but you can't get a You guys want to want to see me after afterwards? I can I can give you an idea. Actually, yeah. It's almost impossible to get rid of Yeah, come come find me over the over the weekend, and I can tell you more. And plus, 
I can get your name and address and then when I get home I can send you we, we do send out free speculation copies of old mailings so you can kind of see what it's uh, what it's about so if you're interested you know let me know and uh, I'll uh, I can send you I can send you some stuff via the old fashioned way snail mail <laughs> let's let the scholars come on up then. yeah I think we're, we'll take a, a five minute break and we'll let the next panel get started Thank you all. Thank you Thank very you. much.